Up next, we have Drew Proch Jensen, who's traveled here from Flowerville, Michigan, to share his work with us. Drew has a belief that everything in life is an art form and that there aren't any boundaries between any of them. With that said, please welcome Drew to the stage. Hang close. I've uh, I've never made it through this before, and uh, uh, if I don't tonight, uh, I'd like it finished. Hi, my name is Drew, and this is a Drew story. I found this old reprint of a newspaper article on the internet. The headline reads, "To become whack." Are you young people? That isn't W H A C K. No, that's W-A-A-C. Miss Laverne Stevens, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. William Stevens of Monterey, has enlisted in the WACs and will leave for the WAC Training Center at Fort Des Moines, Iowa in September. Miss Stevens is the first enlistment from among the women of Pulaski County, the new Sentinel, Friday, August 21st, 1942. And Stevie, was my grandmother's partner and my godmother. No godmother has ever taken the job more seriously. Aunt Stevie was born a farm girl in West Central Ohio early in the, 20, early in the 20th century. She could shoot a pistol like Annie Oakley. She did her chores equal to any man. She cooked fried smelt for Sunday morning breakfast and fried chicken for Sunday dinner and it would make you want to slap your mama. <laughs> but perhaps more important to my value system, she was a musical woman. In her teens and early 20s, she and her sister sang together and toured the surrounding states, small radio stations and barn dances, the kind of thing we can't even comprehend in our modern era. If you've ever traveled, even a little bit south of Michigan, you know that Southern culture begins long before the Mason-Dixon line. Apparently, Aunt Stevie and her sisters toured a lot in Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, singing country songs. What I would give to have the ancient equivalent of YouTube from that era. <laughs> My favorite music I've ever heard, I was privileged to witness in the community church in Douglas, Michigan. Aunt Stevie was always in the church choir. She was kind of an alto baritone. Her voice was very deep, very loud. No choir director ever had an iota of control over her. She was a brilliant counterpoint, a brilliant counterpoint, the fourth part of a three-part harmony. I literally would give my right arm to hear her just one more time. My Aunt Stevie met my grandmother in World War II. They were both wax, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. If I follow the timeline correctly, my grandmother had met and married my grandfather and left her young daughter, my mother, with my great-grandmother, my Nana. Grandma and Stevie and Nana lived a mile outside of the small town I grew up in. Aunt Stevie had bought 40 acres of land before the war. They raised chickens and asparagus. They raised cows for milk and beef. The two-headed calf that was birthed there one spring is now stuffed in the Allegan County Museum after spending much of my youth in their attic. <laughs> I remember when I found out Grandma and Stevie were gay. I'd stopped by their house for some reason, and there were a lot of cars in the driveway that I didn't recognize. I went in, and a bunch of obviously gay men were in the living room with Grandma and Stevie laughing up, just laughing up a storm and having a great time. Now, I knew they were gay men because I was 18 and therefore the smartest guy in the world. <laughs> anyway, when I saw these, all these gay men out at Grandma and Aunt Stevie's house, shoot, I had to warn them, didn't I? <laughs> so I came up with some excuse to have Grandma come into the laundry room so I could talk to her. Grandma, I think all your friends up there are gay. She patted me on the head and said, it's okay, dear. They're our friends. 
Grandma, I don't think you understand. Do you know what gay means? <laughs> I'll never forget her answer. She gently put her hands on my face and looked me square in the eye. Yes, she said, it means that you found someone that you love. The last time I saw Aunt Stevie, she had just survived Hurricane Charlie in, in 2004. With 150 mile per hour winds, Charlie hit Punta Gorda, Florida, where she lived, with unimaginable ferocity. She told me that she sat watching it on her picture window with her cat on her lap, observing her neighborhood being destroyed. I saw the devastation on the television news. I told my boss I was going to be gone for a while and I pointed my car south. I remember getting about 50 miles or so away from the coast and starting to get a weird feeling. At first it didn't register. If all the trees are only leaning at a five degree angle, your brain just adapts. Your head tilts a little bit just to compensate. But as I got closer, the trees were at a 10 degree angle, and a 15, 20, 25 degree angle, all of them. By the time I got close to Punta Gorda, all the trees were at a 60 degree angle of the vertical. It was late in the evening, and the only radio station I could find was broadcasting emergency information, where to get water, how to contact FEMA. They talked about a curfew, too. Getting to Aunt Stevie might prove to be challenging. I knew she was on the south side of town, so I went around the ring road. As I approached the city, I came upon a National Guard roadblock. I stopped. You stop when there's a National Guard roadblock in the road. I ex but I explained to the young serviceman that I had to get into town to help my elderly aunt. He said it was impossible. Nobody could pass until daybreak. Aunt Stevie was expecting me. In 2004, I didn't have a cell phone, but the young guardsman produced his, just a huge brick of it. <laughs> and offered to try and call her and tell her that I wouldn't be allowed, I wouldn't be allowed in that night. Amazingly, he got through to her, even though she was on a, a landline. He explained to her his duty to prevent anyone from entering the curfew zone. And then he did something I didn't expect. He shot to attention. Yes, ma'am, he said. Yes, ma'am. And then he, when he was done talking to her, he handed the phone to me. She said, you be careful, boy. The roads in here are a mess. And then the guardsman let me through. Somehow, despite the fact that all the street signs were blown away, all lights and electricity were off, and parts of houses were strewn, as if Godzilla himself had shuffled through, I found her. While well, everything around was total devastation, her little black house had lost only a few awnings. It was apparently as tough as its owner. After a momentous, emotional hug, one I will remember as well as the last hug I gave her just a few days later, I asked her what she'd said to get me past the guardsman, blocking entry to the city. She smiled a wry smile. I just said, young man, this is Lieutenant Laverne Stevens of the U.S. Army Wax, and I order you to let my guys up pass. <laughs> Thank you. Yes.